Today on the All About Fitness Podcast, I am so stoked to be catching up with Mike Fitch, the creator of Animal Flow. Mike, how are you doing today? And, and really, I want to say a big thank you for taking the time to uh, have this conversation. Hey, Pete, man, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I, it's an honor to be with you, to be hanging out with you. I, I'm great. I'm in Boulder, Colorado. While I'm looking at you on the other side of my screen is the mountain range, which has <laughs> snow on it right now. So it's not a terrible thing. It's not a, not a terrible moment. thing. The, the hard part is you probably want to go out there and be active instead of sitting down, face, you know, doing more screen time, right? Well, tomorrow I'll hit the slopes. So I, I could do a little bit of work until then. It's not going to kill me. Not, not that this is work, let me say. No. Now, are you a skier or a <laughs> snowboarder? I'm a snowboarder. Although uh, this season, I did attempt to ski a couple of times just to mix it up a little bit. So you know, when you're on a snowboard, you're all, for the most part, in kind of the same posture, rotated to the same position, looking over the same shoulder. And I just thought, you know, if, to get a little bit more variety, I'll start trying to learn how to ride switch, which just means riding the opposite direction, and then also throw a couple ski days in there as well. Well, as we get into the conversation of movement, I want to come back to that because I love the fact, and I think I know why you're doing that, but I want to wait to, to, to bring that up. So real quick for listeners, can you give just a quick overview about what animal flow is and, and i just want to say I've, I've heard about you i've read some of your work and seen some of your stuff over the years so it really is finally it's a pleasure to finally be meeting you but give give your little elevator pitch about what animal flow is so people have a concept of what we'll be talking about okay cool yeah so typically i'll i'll start with the visual part first because it really is a visual practice and i usually say if someone says well what is animal flow I'll typically say, well, if you were to see someone practicing it, it may look like yoga meets break dancing meets contemporary dance or gymnastics or something like that, because you know people like to associate with things that they already know. And I say, there is this great misconception when someone hears the name, it is a bit misleading because a lot of people will think, well, is it just about acting like animals for an hour? Is that what I do? <laughs> and I'll say, well, look, we, we do use some animal what we call base positions. We do use some animal locomotion, but really the, the overall concept behind the program is that we are trying to improve the communication, connection, and function of the human animal. And one of the best ways that we you know, see to do that, one, one great way is by putting hands and feet in contact with the ground and moving around. And the why behind it, why do we do these movements is because we're trying to strategically improve all of these physical abilities that we have as human beings. And when I say physical abilities, I mean like strength, power, speed, endurance, mobility, flexibility, stability, because so many people have a tendency to go towards the thing that makes them feel strong or makes them feel successful. So maybe they're going towards one side of the spectrum. So maybe we have a yoga practitioner who really likes to be bendy and flexible and pliable, and that's great, but maybe they're lacking the exposure to having more strength and more speed and more power. Maybe we have an athlete on the other side of the spectrum who really, that's their wheelhouse, but they're like, ah, I don't wanna do mobility training. I don't wanna do flexibility stuff because that's boring to me. This gives them an opportunity or a vehicle to start to get getting into some of those other attributes or biomotor abilities in a way that may also be fun at the same time. So the, the, the over, over, overarching message of the Animal Flow program is it really is whatever you want to make of it. So it can stand alone as a complete approach to fitness and health, or you can take it apart and use it as tools as you see fit. Well, I just have to say for listeners, anytime you use the term biomotor ability, that you know, those are certain little keywords that make my heart go pitter pat, because that gets into the kind of the geekiness uh, you know, it gets into the geekiness of what we do. And I'm going to come back to that in a second. But, but Mike, when I was reading about your background, I would have thought that I would have found out that you're like a competitive parkour athlete or that maybe you were uh, a gymnast, maybe you competed in the NCAA in, in, in gymnastics. But what's your background and what kind of gave you the, the, the motivation or, or the thought to, to start an animal flow? Well, First of all, thank you for thinking that. Um, I actually have very little movement experience, especially not on a, a competitive level in my early days, I should say. So I started as a personal trainer. I believe I obtained my NSCA CPT when I was 19 years old, and I just started as a career personal trainer very young uh, in New York City. And I 
did what most trainers do that are really, really kind of geeky. Like you said, that, that pitter patter, uh, that's been my entire career. It's like, ah, oh, let me get, get, gather all the information that I possibly can. So I, I just jumped headfirst into as many different modalities, as many different uh, philosophies, methodologies, approaches as, as I could. And, you know, over about, let's say 11 to 12 years, I just ran the gamut. I really got into Olympic, Olympic lifting, really got into kettlebells when they were first becoming popular in the States. I became a medical exercise specialist, getting really into pre and post, uh, post uh, training or rehabilitation and found myself in a phase where I think most guys do. I think it's safe to say that where I just decided I wanted to like get jacked and lift the heaviest things that I possibly could and, and put on as much muscle mass as possible. And I did that for about a, about two years, let's say. And I, I got to the point to where I just didn't feel great in my body. I was 30 years old and I was like, man, I, I am too young to feel this old. <laughs> as much as I knew about proper periodization and technique and blah, blah, blah. I was just like, something has to change. Right. So I decided and I'm a little bit of an extremist in this way, I decided to do the exact opposite thing that I was doing. So I put down the weights 100% and just started exploring body weight movement-based disciplines. So I did get into gymnastics for a very short amount of time, which led me to parkour. Uh, I had a great parkour slash gymnastics coach. That led me to break dancing. Uh, I dabbled in circus arts. And I have to admit, first of all, I was terrible at everything that I tried. I was really, really bad. So it's always fun to be the oldest and worst person in every single class that you take. <laughs> but I was fully inspired. And that was the thing. I wasn't discouraged at all. I just thought to myself, wow, I've been working so long on my body, but I don't have much ability to really work my body. So let me take this inspiration and let me see if I can create something that my clients could experience that would give them some similar benefits to, to the benefits that I was experiencing through these different modalities. So let's say, for example, in parkour, I learned a lot about fluid transmission of energy, flow itself. That's where I first picked up animal locomotion as a way to you know, warm up and prepare the body for movement. Uh, from breakdancing, I learned uh, what, uh, about what we call in animal flow now movement windows, which is if I'm in this shape on the ground, I have these different opportunities. Oh, well, here's a window I can take an arm through, I can take a leg through to complete this fluid transition again of energy and motion. So that's, that was the, the impetus, that was the catalyst. Then it was just, okay, let me spend all day, every day in between clients, figuring out how I could create some sort of system that would allow anyone to come in and feel successful right away. Although if they chose to get deeper into it, they certainly could. And then again, as I mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, it could be used as single tools or used as a complete approach. So that was really the, the birth of animal flow. And what I like about it is looking, having understand, understood movement, and I was having this conversation recently. I mean, if you're from New York, do you know uh, Liz Halfpap and uh, Fred DeVito, the creator, they, they created Exhale. They're big bar instructors, but the, their background is dance. And I was talking, and, and they said something thinking that, I would be a little bit of a meathead and not appreciate dance. But I have to tell you, Mike, as I've gotten older, as I've matured, and, and especially as I've really understood coordinated movement, I look at dance as being extremely athletic. And that's one of the things where I wish I could go back to my younger self and say, hey, get over being a meathead, go take some dance classes, take, you know, as a teenager, take some gymnastics, take some yoga, because that's an entirely different way to move. And where I'm going with this because I read something in re doing the research for this about how you define, you kind of qualify movement and exercise. How have we traditionally, when we generally think of like working out in the gym, how have we traditionally approached exercise? How do we traditionally approach it? Yeah, how do we traditionally uh, approach exercise? Uh, it's typically outcome driven. So I need to do this so I can get this. Or the other, the other class, I didn't, I didn't lead you, I didn't give a good enough question. Um, but it's also too, we, we tend to look at it as parts, right? As one day right. we're doing like chest day, another day we're doing like whatever leg day, shoulder day, whatever neck day. But, you know, but in reality, your approach is more towards movement, correct? Correct. Yeah, exactly. And so it's not going to be as compartmentalized as the traditional strength training program of chest day, back and buys, 
Uh, and that that is a great way to look at the body as a global unit. And you know, I think it's pretty safe to say that that most and, and maybe not all exercise enthusiasts, right? But for sure, most fitness professionals would say muscles don't work in isolation. I think that's that's a pretty solid understanding now that the body, for the most part, uh, works as one integrated unit, or we hope that it does. <laughs> so whenever, <laughs> yeah, whenever we are we're we're figuring out these motor tasks, we're we're approaching these things that we want to learn these motor skills. It's such a different experience, and, and the way in which I always like to talk about it is it's honoring the complexity of the system. And you know, we have this great privilege of inhabiting these amazing human bodies. And the, you know, they're, they're capable, uh, we don't even understand yet what they're capable of, but, but I know that for most, and, and that's a very generalized statement, but for most people, when they think of exercise, it's let me stay, you know, singular plane, let me go in, do the same loads over and over again, let me count the repetitions, let me count the sets. And is that useful? Yes, 100%, I would never say that that doesn't have its place. But again, it's like we're looking at one little component of this entire, entire spectrum of the body. And whenever we get into complex movements, like you're talking about dance, I love dance. I've been going to the local dance studio here in Boulder and just jumping into all of these classes and again, allowing myself to be really, really terrible at all of them, because in that challenge is the growth. And, you know, again, we have the tendency to go to the things that make us feel strong. But when we go to the things that expose our weaknesses and expose the opportunities to grow, why not go deeper into them versus shy away from them? And of course, that's where the ego gets involved. And that's one of those things I love to talk about, you know, keep the child's mind, leave the ego behind, allow yourself to be vulnerable, to be open, to not be amazing at something right away, because you know, the journey of self-mastery is not one that we actually reach. It's actually the journey. I'm gonna go meditate on that for a couple minutes. So excuse me, real <laughs> no. But it's been all serious. Did I go out there too that, much? Sorry about that. No, but as you're saying that, Mike, I, you you talk about a movement window, and I get the idea of what you're talking about. And to use your analogy of where you are, you're probably for listeners, he's sitting in Boulder, and you probably have this huge picture window that you can look out of. And that to me is a good description of animal flow. Animal flow is this huge picture window that you can see the entire Rocky Mountain range in front of you. Yet, if you go to isolation training, instead of having that picture window, you're looking at a little eight, eight inch porthole of where you can maybe only see a limited field of vision. Is that kind of how you would describe the difference? I mean, yes, you can still see out through the porthole, but you're seeing a much different, it's a much different experience than looking out a picture window. That is a fantastic analogy. I really, really like that. I'm going to steal that from you. Go for it. Thank yeah. you for that. Oh, but <laughs> but yes, go for it. I mean, yeah. it, it it really is. It's it's like putting on, you know, it's like putting on your matrix glasses. It's seeing the potential in a completely different way. And you know, that was one thing that I that I picked up in my during uh, my my introduction to parkour and in my parkour practice. You would literally see the world as if you had new eyes. You know, you would see, oh, here's potential to do this, to go from here to here, and then back to here. And it's very similar with animal flow when. You know, you're so used to seeing people, everything is linear, everything is sagittal plane, everything is I'm moving in this direction, I have to maintain these perfect, uh, perfect, I'm using air quotes, joint angles, and if I don't, then I'm not going to get the benefits, I'm going to hurt myself, I'm going to, knee can't go past toe, you know, all of these, these things, and so it really does allow you to go, oh, wow, the body can move in so many ways, it can create so many shapes. I can load my tissue, joint, connective tissue, fascial system. I can do all of that by using gravity and just changing my relationship in space to gravity's downward pull. And now I'm getting all of these wide spectrum loads throughout my entire system. And it's just, it is, it's that, that big picture looking at the body uh, in, in, with those new eyes. So yes, thank you for that. And, and certainly, but because when I was a young man and, and a personal trainer, I, w I remember I went to some conference. It was it was 2000. It was the fall of 2000. And I'm sure you've, you've run across J.C. Santana, Juan Carlos Santana mm -hmm. at some point. And I, I raised my hand. I went up on stage and he put me through the dumbbell matrix, which is a forward lunge, lateral lunge, transverse plane lunge. It's moving in all three planes of motion. 
And I have to say, Mike, that blue, I mean, that was that take that that was my taking the red pill because that really is when I made that shift from going linear body part to training more movement. That's what started me on that journey of performing that matrix. And I have to tell you, over the years since then, and I went through Gary Gray's uh, fellowship, I went through Gary's 50, whatever, 48, 50 week functional institute of motion or whatever was he called, the, the Gray Institute for Functional Training to really dive into the biomechanics of human motion. And, and what that's done and what that's allowed for me to do is really understand that exercise is a functional movement, right? If we mm -hmm. exercise, we are moving the body. But if we do a part, if we do an isolated part, we're, we're only moving one segment of the body as opposed to moving the whole. So as a result, where I'm going with this question is, for myself, I know that I feel different if I do a movement-based exercise program. If I wanna feel really funky, I go and do isolated body parts and I can feel it like literally the next day because I've isolated load in one part of the body. When you started playing with it, we started doing parkour and started taking these classes. And I love the fact that you did a circus class how what did it feel like how awkward did you feel at first and and how did it ultimately make you feel to go from that transition from linear to multi-planar you know it it was such an incredibly intoxicating journey i think that's one way i could i could say it uh and same way that you talked about that dumbbell matrix the thing that really began to open my eyes to moving through multiple planes of motion was actually when I got first got into kettlebells and I had a really, really great coach slash friend who was really into kettlebell juggling and was really into using mm. kettlebells in, in very non-traditional ways. And I was just like, whoa, wait a minute, what are you doing right now? Yeah. <laughs> this is the craziest stuff I've ever seen. And so to be able to, to move load around and position your body to absorb and produce energy and power and strength it was just like it was so eye eye opening and that obviously laid the foundation so i knew there was something there that in that that immediately became enticing to me so i just thought okay uh, so i had those eyes i want to see more and whenever i began parkour began all these different things it the way and i want to echo what you said the way that my body felt was i could not deny that it was such a different feeling and I used that word intoxicating earlier because that's how I felt when I would do it. I was just like, I was buzzing. I was, I was high off of it. And as, you know, as, as poorly as I was performing, I was still just so engaged. And then whenever I started coming up, and actually I have to say, even before I started creating the animal flow program, I would bring some of these inspirations into my training. So I would like teach, you know, my older client, let's say Sherry, a six step from break dancing and and it was like a really cool thing to watch her just go wow this is so challenging but i really like it can we do more of this so it, it became clear to me that not only was i fully fully engaged and really um you know loving the experience but then also my clients just a little bit that i was sharing with them it it, it excited them as well and, and then they would start asking for it and so that's when it was it was really like all right well there's something here that needs to be explored that traditional fitness is not exploring. Well, let's look at the movement aspects, right? Because when we start learning movement and, and you start, well, you start learning anything, your body releases dopamine and dopamine is that feel good neurotransmitter, right? So that the more you start doing it, as awkward as it feels, when you start linking those two or three moves of parkour, when you make that jump to that roll, to that whatever, it starts feeding forward. What did your clients say? As, as you started introducing this and you started putting your system together, what was their response? And, and, and basically, because I look at it, Mike, is like, you're like that drug dealer, right? You, you, know, you have people coming up, man, give me more, give me more because of the way it makes them feel, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that, that was a drug I was happy to share. Um, yeah, and you know, it, it's so interesting whenever you get someone on, the, and it doesn't matter, I'm, I'm going to use the, the ground as an example because there there is so much feedback there. So whenever you get hands and feet in contact with the ground and you start moving around proprioceptively, it's just a rich environment for learning. It's also a great environment to take people out of their brain. And what I mean by that, it's like they're, they're not thinking so much about anything else that's going on in their day. They're not thinking about stress at work. They can't tune out. They have to be engaged. So they, they're, the mindfulness has to be there. They have to think about what they're doing, especially when you're giving them commands like left, 
and I'm just going to say some some things we would use. So like left leg under switch, right leg side kick through, left arm crab reach. Because one, they have to go, all right, which is my left and my right? Two, what is the call that you're asking me to perform? And then actually doing that with, with precision. So you have them fully, fully immersed in this experience to where, again, they can't think about other things. But in that moment of those glitches where they go, oh, what's left, what's right? I always really try to paint that picture of, guys, that's where the money is. That's where the gold is. That's where your body is being forced to grow and adapt and change. You know, um, there have been a couple of really cool uh, studies done on animal flow over the past couple of years. And one of them was just showing that a four-week novel animal flow movement, quadrupedal movement program, increased noticeably increased markers of cognition. So it's not just the body part, it's the brain part as well. So, you know, just getting people on the ground. And I always say, like, I'm not just going to push animal flow. I'm like, like, just get on the ground and move around. Like, there's so much there, that cross-lateral stimulation, getting the brain and the body connected. It's just, you know, it's underutilized in that kind of turn off, shoot for repetitions training. Well, and, and that's exactly, that was going to be my next question, Mike, was going to the cognitive benefit and to the brain benefit, especially if you're working with an older clientele and for listeners, I'm going to hold up my phone, my iPhone right now. And that's my, my daughter does these, these sticks her tongue out when she's mad at me, her, her, her like getting at me is, is changing the, is changing the lock screen on my iPhone. But Mike, what you're doing is you're teaching people how to be like an iPhone, whatever it is now, 20 X, whatever, whatever the latest iPhone is. Whereas being in an isolation program is like carrying around a Motorola flip phone from 2003. That's one way that I describe movement is if you're doing linear isolation movement, you're you're basically a Motorola flip phone. Whereas if you're moving to multiple planes, you, you're you're uploading you're uploading into the highest operating system. But really, so you have research showing the cognitive benefits, and where do those cognitive benefits come from? Can it really help people enhance their brain power? That that's I think that's I want to, I want to hear you talk about that a little bit because I think I understand why, but it'd be cool to hear what your experience has been. Yeah, so you know, it's there. There's definitely, there's definitely research, and there, um, there's definitely a lot of information about how crawling, you know, obviously is part of our motor milestones, is part of our neurodevelopmental processes or stages, and it's so important to developing the baby or the infant's brain. Um, unfortunately, rarely once we become upright bipedal human beings moving around in our adult bodies we no longer return to the floor to continue to gather and gain those benefits of how the brain works with the body and stimulating the brain in a different way. And so whenever they came to us, uh, the researchers who were, who were working on this project, whenever they came to us and asked us, you know, one, did we mind if they use the animal flow program? Uh, of course not. And two, you know, we, we said, we would love to help you any way that you can. The, any way that we can, uh, we were really excited because we already saw anecdotally, we saw people, you know, people would come in, they would perform some animal flow classes, they would go, wow, I really feel different in my body. And I just feel a little bit sharper. You know, I feel like, uh, you know, I can kind of stay more tuned in, or I can stay more laser focused throughout the day. And there, I don't know if there's anything there, but you know, it feels different. So that's why we were so excited that they were actually going to do a test. And they, they did it on, you know, they used two things. One was on joint repositioning sense. So they just wanted to see if uh, the awareness of where someone's joints were in space uh, improved when using animal flow. And then also, again, the markers of cognition. And it, as I mentioned before, just, just as short as four weeks, there were noticeable changes. And, you know, I, I would love to, to, take steps further into that research and see what else they, they can prove, especially even over a longer timeline, especially if we're looking at possibly slowing down degenerative processes. You know, uh, I think there's a lot there, especially as you mentioned, Pete, in the elder population. I would love to see if that quadrupedal movement, whatever approach it is, if it, we can actually slow down some of the de degenerative brain processes. Um, but yeah, man, it was it was really great to see that that those 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 things that people were experiencing actually did have some validity to them in the research world as well. Well, one of the things I love about doing, and I've never practiced animal flow specifically, but you can imagine I've played around quite a bit with rolling patterns and getting up off the mm -hmm. ground and, and, and doing those type of movement patterns. 
And one of the things that I think what people don't understand is the amount of nerve endings we have in our hands and our feet and how that if you engage both your feet and your hands, talk about that a little bit, because the way I learned this, Mike, and I might be wrong in this, but the way I learned it is it's like a closed feedback loop that if we're on the ground using our hands and our feet at the same time, we're getting, we're kind of wiring everything together. Is that one of the things that you've seen? Have you seen how people using their hands and the feet all of a sudden can just improve overall coordination? Is that one of the benefits from doing animal flow? Yeah, absolutely. And then again, I'll, I'll bring up another uh, research study that was just done by Jeff Buxton, where he used animal flow with, with a, a group of uh, participants. And there's a noticeable increase in coordination. Uh, they used the FMS and a couple of different tests um, uh, to, to check mobility, coordination, FMS scores, and a couple of other things. And you, you hit, hit the nail on the head there, Pete, when you were saying uh, nerve endings. And another way that you can think about that is sensory receptors, right? And so in our hands and our feet, we have a lot of sensory receptors, mechanoreceptors that are sending information about our place in space, about our load, about the surface that we're in contact with. And so when you're thinking about the body map within the brain, a lot of people will use that analogy with the map and the better our proprioceptive awareness is, the better the map is. So whenever you have someone who has hands and feet in contact with the ground, they're getting a lot of information from their extremities. And that information is passing through all of our joints. So if you think, you know, all the way from the toes to the fingertips, I mean, that's a lot of potential for our neuromuscular system, for our fascial netting, for our, uh, you know, our ligaments, joints, capsules. Like there's just so many, so many uh, articulations and, and points of anatomy that that information has to travel through. And think about what that's doing to that, that 3D map within our brain. Like it's really filling in all those spaces so that we get this greater awareness of where our body is so that then whatever we choose to do outside of that. So, you know, we used to jokingly say, what does animal flow make you good at? Everything, <laughs> you know? And, and the reason we would say that is because again, it's bringing more awareness, not only consciously, but also on all those other subconscious levels and automated systems. So we are creating that much bigger understanding of our body, not only consciously, but also um, in the way that our body communicates with itself. And one of the things I like about this, Mike, and looking and understanding the program is yoga is a great practice, but in yoga, you're relatively, you maintain the same space in yoga. And yes, you make some transitions, but you don't make the same sequences of transitions that I've seen in some of the animal flow videos. And, and so where I'm going with this is for somebody my age, I'm 48 years old. I, I call myself a recovering meathead. I go to a bench press anonymous meeting on Mondays. We talk about how we, we you know, it's been excellent. It's probably been seven years since I've done my last barbell bench press. I'm working the steps. I'm doing all that good stuff. Um, but in all seriousness, the body, feel, my body feels so much different now in my 40s, having incorporated this amount of movement and, and, and taking this approach towards exercise. How important is it if people out there listening, if it's if it's guys, I think you're probably in your mid to late 30s, just listening to you, you know, your, your background and stuff. Guys our age that have spent their lives moving iron or moving steel. How important is it to step outside of that comfort zone and start doing this type of exercise and what type of benefits could they expect from it? And you, you've covered a lot of the benefits, but just I want I want people to think about we got to move beyond what yeah. we've been doing in order to read option to reach an optimal level of fitness. Yeah. So, and that's such a great topic, Pete. And, and, and I, 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 I just turned 40 uh, in July and, you know, it, for me personally, it's better every year, right? It's, it's not just going, Oh man, I'm getting old. My knees gone to shit. I, you know, this is that, and that no way, man, the more time that we spend in our bodies, the more opportunity we have to get to know them even better, how they work, how to use them, et cetera. But to go back to specifically what you're talking about, the key there, and I'm a big believer that the key for longevity is variability. And so when we're looking at creating resilient bodies, resilient bodies are built around variable loads. 
So, you know, our bodies, again, are these incredibly complex machines. They're adaptation machines. They will adapt specifically to the imposed demands, that good old line. And so what that means to someone who's listening is if we do the exact same thing day after day after day after day, our bodies will adapt to be stronger in that thing and to be more efficient in that thing, sometimes to our de detriment. So the more that we can, and sometimes that adaptation may be that we have over, over repetition, stress, uh, injuries, it may be that the tissue has actually adapted and has distorted our posture. It may be that we've, it's changed our mechanics and how we move. But whenever we get into a place where we can uh, uh, introduce multiple loads at multiple angles, we can move our joints in as many ways as possible through all planes of motions. The adaptation process then becomes again, 3D. So now our body is adapting to these loads in a 3D manner, which hopefully will make every one of those joints, will make our connective tissue stronger, more resilient in all different angles and all different ways. That way, as we age and as we go through these cellular regeneration processes, that we're building stronger bodies that are more capable of taking loads of life. And that's really what function is, right? So if we can create a higher functional capacity, which means we can be better in our bodies for life, then that is the ultimate goal. So, you know, if you're into strength training, awesome. You may, you know, once you hit 70 years old, you may no longer care how much you can bench press, deadlift, squat, but you'll probably care how you feel inside of your body and how you've lived inside of your body will dictate how you feel inside of your body as you get into some, some, some years later down the road. And so you may no longer be into working out the same way, but again, you're still going to feel how you trained. And I think that's the best way I can say it without trying to bash any style of training, because I do believe that all styles of training for the most part are positive for the right person at the right time, as long as again, we're experiencing a variation uh, through through a, a lifetime or cycle. And, and I love the fact that you're bringing in, you're, you're bringing in so many things, Mike. You're bringing in movement variability, you're bringing in loads. And, and I don't know if you know this, but I worked with Mashal for a while in the Institute of Motion and helping and helping teach that. So it's like some of these are terms I haven't heard like for a few years or applied for a few years. And I've actually, I don't know how well you know Sturgio, I think it's Nick Sturgio out of Oregon who does a, who's done a lot of the research on movement variability, but we haven't been able to align our schedules because, because yeah, you're talking the language of what people should start adapting in the gyms. And, and I asked a male specific question, but I also want to address this question for females. Cause again, I think there can be very fit, very strong females, whether they do yoga or strength training, but this can provide so many benefits. And I see it because of the transitions and it's because of making a transition from one movement to the next. So let me ask you this question. Describe a couple of the base movements. Do you have base movements in animal flow? And what are a couple of the base movements and, and how do you transition from one to the other? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's, you know, it is a bit challenging to just talk through it. However, I think that most people listening would be able to understand this be um, in the way in which I should be able to hopefully break it down. But in our base positions, I'm glad that you use that, that, that phrase base positions, because we do call our, our base positions in animal flows. They are actually named after animals. And so, you know, I said that the whole program is not animal based, but there are some base positions that we use a deep squat. For example, we call our ape position, a, uh, uh, what, what would be a step up from a baby crawl. So if you're thinking like six points of contact, hands, knees, and tops of feet, if that were baby crawl, our beast is by tucking the toes underneath and lifting the knees one inch from the ground. Then, so if you think the complementary position to that is a crab position. And so fingers are pointing backwards, hips are down close to the ground. And if you're looking at it from like, uh, you know, uh, the geeky lens, you can think about Oh, well, in my beast, it's very flexion chain or anterior chain dominant as far as load perspective. In my crab, it's very much a posterior chain or extensor chain dominant position holding that isometric. Then when we get into locomote, now we're starting to get into those anterior, posterior oblique slings as we're moving in cross lateral patterns. 
that's geeky stuff we don't need to get into. But when we are talking about transition, so if you're thinking, all right, I have my ABCs, Ape, Beast, and Kreb, if that is just like the base positions for a lot of movements, then we have a library of probably uh, you know close to a hundred movements of what we call switches and transitions and those switches and transitions are what build the flows or make up the flows uh, as you learn how to perform them so it's just something as simple as here's a great example if i'm in that beast position where it's hands and feet in contact with the ground the knees are one inch from the ground i perform an under switch by the way, guys, the, the names in Animal Flow are descriptive. They're not creative. An under switch <laughs> just means that the leg is traveling underneath the body and I'm switching from a beast base to a crab base or a crab base for, to a beast base. And again, from a really geeky perspective, just going from that beast position, taking a leg under and transitioning into that crab position. The cool thing about that is I'm, again, if I'm using this analogy of their range, the, excuse me, gravity's downward pull is kind of like rain that's coming down, bathing our tissues, right? And as we begin to move through that beast to crab, it's almost like our body is a rotisserie and we're transitioning slowly through space and we're getting all that downward load, bathing our tissues in transverse movement, which is very unique. Like it's hard to replicate that in a loaded scenario, even if you're using cables and bands and, and whatever you have in your toolbox. So just something as simple as that. And, and whoever's listening at home, you can try that getting hands and feet, uh, knees just in front of the hip line, knees one inch from the ground, and then trying to lift the opposite hand and foot take it underneath the body and find that crab position that you probably did in a gym class when you were younger. And then just going back and forth between those two, like that is such a simple movement that can reap huge benefits, especially if you're sitting there at your desk all day, like where most of us are these days, you know, just getting on the ground, getting that feedback, getting that proprioceptive awareness and then just moving your body in a way that would be that can introduce load that you typically would not experience. And then you know you have the added benefit of oh, close chain shoulder rotation. You know the list goes on. And what I'm going to do for listeners is I'm going to link below, and even on YouTube, I'm going to link below. I'm going to find one or two of your videos. I know you have them out there, and I'll link below so people can get an idea of how to do that. Now, how would you fit animal flow? And I like the fact that you're not being only specific to one to one genre but how would you fit animal flow into an overall weekly program i'm a 40 something year old recovering meathead i still want to do some strength training how many days a week would i start incorporating or should i start incorporating an animal flow sequence or start doing a workout and i'm going to come to your app in a minute but how many how many days a week should i start looking at incorporating this type of movement into my overall program yeah and you know i think the best thing you know, you, Pete, you know, you can have the best program in the world, but if someone doesn't enjoy doing it, it's, it's not going to help them, right? So I, one thing that I love doing for someone who is a, a, a chronic meathead or someone who's a recovery meathead is you, you, you introduce it in these little digestible pieces, right? So you don't just go, oh, bro, never touch a barbell again. From now on, you're just doing animal flow, you know, like that's if you not told me that. Yeah, if you told me that I'd walk away and I wouldn't talk to you again. I'd be like, what are you talking about? Precisely. So, you know, how can we integrate it? And that's, you know, I think that's one of the really cool things about the program is I may say, all right, well, how about this? Whenever you go in to train, don't I'm not going to say you have to do any just animal flow days, but let's say every time that you go into train, you use this flow as a way to activate your body and get multiple loads into your joints before you start to train. Then in between sets, and you might look a little weird, the other bros at the gym might laugh at you a little bit at first, yeah. but in between other sets, get down on the ground and do this sequence. And maybe it's an opposing sequence, right? So maybe if I'm pressing, then it's more of a kind of pulling move, you know, body weight movement, or, or maybe it's more of a opening if I'm condensing while I'm loaded. So, you know, it's really just, go, you know, just adding in these little digestible bits of movement, these little movement snacks. And then you may see that they go, oh, wow, well, this makes me feel better. I can still do the stuff that makes me feel really strong and, you know, macho or whatever that, that thing is. But now I'm starting to create 
longevity, resilient tissues. I'm starting to, you know, maybe feel a little different when I get done, maybe not so beat up. Maybe the next time I come in, I feel better when I bench squat, you know, deadlift, whatever. So it really is that to me, it's, it's how can we make this introduce us into someone's life or their program in a way that feels good. It feel, they feel successful versus just going, Hey, you're going to do an hour of animal flow. Every time let's start with this super complex flow that you don't even, you can't even get into. And if you can't, then you suck. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who is that helping? Well, and the reason why I asked that, because I have to tell you, Mike, some of my favorite workouts and I do them about one or two days a week are just body weight workouts where I'm moving. It's like I, an unloaded body weight movement where I'll do some crawling patterns. I'll do some prone patterns. I'll do some, you know, supine stuff and, and hip mobility, some, some walking, some like walking agility drills. And I have to say that, you know, and I know some guys at the gym look at me funny when I was going to uh, the 24 hour fitness before it closed down because I'd use that indoor turf area and I'd be moving all over it. But walking out of there, my my back feels awesome. My hips feel groovy. And the next day, it allows me to come in and just really go hard. And that's one message I try to, 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 to make consistently on the podcast and in the content I create is that we do not need to crush ourselves every day in order for a workout to be effective. We can have two, maybe three challenging workouts a week. But the fact is, we just want to move every day. Which gets me to to where where you are now. When did you come out with the Animal Flow app, and what kind of response have you seen on it, especially over the last year when people have been trying to figure out how to work from home or work out from home? Yeah, so we so we start. By the way, Animal Flow. We just had our tenth anniversary, so we've been around a decade. And you know, it was it was funny because when we first started getting some eyes on us, everyone you know they would call us like the new fitness fad, the new, you know, and, and everyone would see it as this fad thing that would eventually pass. And here we are 10 years later. And uh, it just shows that I only see this thing picking up speed. And again, I'm, I'm not set on animal flows the only way. I'm set on that free movement is the way. So, so what we decided to do a, about a year and a, gosh, a year and a half ago. Yeah, so this was pre, pre-COVID we were looking at our next step or where are we going with the, the company? And in the, the previous years, our main focus was on certifying other fitness professionals. So we wanted to educate the people who educated people. So we, that was really our main push, our main focus. And we did have an instructional DVD that we put out over the years for the general consumer. But, you know, we were really looking at, we were, looked at ourselves as an education company. Uh, we started to branch off and say, you know, now we're ready. I, I feel like we have the confidence. We have the, the community, which is a big part of, of Animal Flow. Let's reach as many people as we possibly can. So let's, let's, you know, try to really do as much outreach. Let's figure out different ways that people can get involved in the community and the system, explore it, see if this is something for them. And so we, we, we put together this on-demand channel and corresponding app. And on that channel, you have flows you have classes you have tutorials of all different levels and it was it was really cool to see as soon as we put it out there were you know our a big response a very common response that we got right away was we've been hearing about this thing but we didn't we couldn't get into it like we didn't know anyone that was teaching a class we didn't know anyone that was an instructor nearby so this allowed us to reach different parts of the world that we hadn't actually entered into to do workshops and train instructors there but then of course whenever uh, everything shifted and people were spending out, you know, their entire life at home in their house, they were looking at different ways in which they could utilize their body because maybe they didn't have access to the gym. They didn't have their weights and kettlebells and dumbbells. So they really started focusing on, okay, well, what can I do with this thing that I'm in? And that's where we saw, you know, a big spike of course in the subscriptions, but even better than that, we saw people going, oh, wow, I don't need to buy other things. Like I am in the thing that I can use to work out. Mind blowing. And then, you know, of course, that that means that for the rest of their life, they realize that they're in the most sophisticated exercise tool ever made. And that, there's a lot of power there. So I think to me, that was the most gratifying thing to see. And then um, just reaching, again, reaching more people because community is so important to us in this program. Well, and that's good. We're going to get ready to wrap it up here in a couple of minutes. And I love hearing that, right? Because when I look at this, this is such a needed thing to get people moving and just get them into multiplanar movement. 
And it's hard to, it really is, having done this and, and lived in this world for so long, Mike, it, it's really hard to kind of contextualize it without having, without having a, a de definitive understanding of planes of motion or, or different joint actions. It's hard to kind of contextualize this. And what I like about animal flow is that you've put it in a way that's digestible first by the fitness professional and then by the consumer because a consumer might not understand hip flexion internal rotation yada 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 transverse plane this but to show them a sequence of hey here's what you can do using just your body that's all you need to do right because it, it really gets them engaged but one of the things i wanted to ask you is what what was it like and even though this this podcast i try to gear towards the general consumer i like i like that i want to ask this question from a business standpoint because I look at Animal Flow as a program like a Zumba or or a spinning. Uh, that's a branded and you know people say spinning generically, but it's a branded program. And what? How much work did it take for you to to start Animal Flow as a branded consistent program? And what is your what was your expectation? Did you did you think it would grow to be where it is now? Our our goal certainly was, you know, in this. I'm going to say this and it may come off in an odd way to some people, but we wanted to be as recognizable as when you say yoga, right? So that was kind of the idea is we wanted to keep pushing this thing in every angle of the world as much as we could supporting our people as, as well as we could um, to where it became this thing that you shared with other people. And I think that, that, you know, I said community a million times earlier and community is such a buzz word, but really it, I always, it, I always likened it to, you know, remember when tapes were a thing and you would have someone that made like a mixtape and they would give you their summer jams mixtape and they'd be like, yo, listen to this tape. That's how I wanted animal flow to be. I wanted to be, Hey, have you done this thing? I love the way that it makes me feel. Let's do it together. Let's learn it together. Let's, you know, and we could, because we were seeing that with our early instructors, even if they were in different countries, when we started expanding to different countries, uh, when someone would travel and they would go to another country, they would just get online and go like, what other animal flow instructors are here? And then they would meet up. And so it would just, it wouldn't be just about working out. It would be about, hey, let's experience something together that is movement based. And so with that always being the direction, with that always being the driving factor, I had no doubt that it would gain in popularity. Um, did I think that it would get as big as it is now? I, I don't think I had any idea I, because, you know, again, as anyone who puts something together and just goes a hundred percent into it and doesn't care what anyone else says or, or thinks um, you're always going to go, I don't know. Like, I, yeah, you're going to have your self doubts. You're going to have your days where you're like, what the hell am I doing? Is this really a thing? Is it, you know, who am I to think that I could come up with something that would be popular or, or whatever? Uh, and that's just part of the human, you know, condition. So uh, I, to answer your question, I'm super grateful that we have gotten as much traction as we have. I think it will continue to expand. And I always say, I don't look at myself as the creator. I just look at myself as I give thanks that I get to be part of it. I'm just part of the other, the rest of the team. And I know that, you know, and, uh, and actually, because you said, Pete, that you used to work with Michelle, one of the greatest pieces of advice that Michelle gave me when I first started, um, you know, he mentored me a bit in the beginning when, whenever I was first launching Animal Flow. Uh, he said, don't try to duplicate yourself. He said, when you're building your team of master instructors, find other people who are also rock stars in their own right. They have their own identity. They have their own personality. And that's exactly what we did. And so Animal Flow is not just tied to me. It's the concept is all of us. It gives us all wings and, and you know, raises us up. And so that way, if I, you know, God forbid, whatever happens to me, this thing can still continue to go. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to revolve around me. And I think that's one of the greatest things and that gives it, it freedom. That's so cool you shared that about Michelle because that, I, I could see him saying that. And I know as he was putting IOM together, he was very deliberate in that approach of he didn't want it to be about him. He wanted it to be about the entire thought process. I'm sorry, if I'm going to be quoting Michelle, I got to say process. You know, he wanted to be about, <laughs> he wanted to be about the, because he's Canadian for listeners. Um, he wanted to be about the entire process. 
But as we wrap up, get ready to wrap up, where can people get more information about Animal Flow? And, and I want to say this, Mike, before, before we log off, is I have two kids. My, 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 my daughters are six and eight years old as we record this. And my older daughter is a phenomenal climber. I had her start climbing things. As soon as she could walk, I'd take her to the playground and have her start climbing. And so what I want to, my vision for her, like I'm one of these, I don't want to be one of these sports parents. My vision for her is I want to see her do the Ninja Warrior. I want to see her get into parkour. I want to see her get into that movement because I want her to have a lifetime love of movement. I want her to have mm. movement literacy. And one of the things I really, and, and the reason where I'm going with this is one of the things I see about your program is you're reintroducing movement literacy to the adult is you're going to where you find, where do adults go to, to work out? For the most part, we don't go to the playground where kids go, we go to the gym. And by introducing Animal Flow, you gave permission for adults to get out and play in the gym like they would at a playground. And that, yeah. that in my mind is something that the fitness industry has missed the boat on entirely. So as I've seen Animal, grow, sorry, animal Flow from a distance and I've watched it, watched it evolve and I've seen, I think it was, I think I was in New York in 2012 or 2013. And is Violet Zaki one of your instructors? I think. Uh, I'm not sure by name. Okay. But, but I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, if you knew Violet, I think she was teaching at an Equinox. And I think it was an animal flow class at an Equinox in New York. And it may not have been, it may have been another class. But the thing was packed, dude. I, I'm pretty sure it was, if it wasn't an animal flow, it was similar to that. But it was a movement based class. And that thing was packed on a Saturday morning, nose to toes, everybody in there moving. And that's one of the things I think is really cool is that you're bringing movement literacy back. You're bringing movement back into the gym. And on that note, where can people get more information, whether it's the app, whether it's the online program? If people are interested and go, man, this sounds like something I want to do, how do they do it? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, just to what you were saying, it probably – was an animal flow class because we were with Equinox exclusively for like a year. So they were definitely doing some animal flow classes there. And the kids, we're, we'll be launching our animal flow kids program this this year. So it will not only be a, oh, cool. uh, a program for our animal flow certified instructors, but we'll also be launching some animal flow kids classes on our on-demand channel. So that way, you know, you can hang out, do some animal flow with your kids, which we're pretty excited about. Uh, but uh, animalflow.com, if you go to animalflow.com, you can find you know, the on-demand information, on-demand app information. You can sign up for our newsletter where you'll get some free videos uh, that you can just check out and see if it's for you. You can go to the Animal Flow YouTube channel. I always tell people if you want to check out the on-demand app, there's a 14-day trial. Check it out. If you don't like it, just delete it <laughs> or you know, unsubscribe. Just check it and see if it's for you. So, uh, so yeah, so that's how you can find us. And then Animal Flow Official on Instagram and MikeFitch.af uh, is my personal one. I, I'm super excited. I am, Mike. I'm super excited to hear that you're coming out with Animal Flow for Kids. And my ex-wife, their mother, is still, is still an instructor for Equinox if it ever opens again in Carlsbad, California. So I'm sure she would be be up for doing that. Well, hey, man, I really, Mike, it's been a lot of fun having this conversation with you. And like I said, I mean, I saw you, I, when I saw this develop, I think I was at American Council on Exercise. And I've seen, you know, having, knowing that we have some friends in common and some colleagues in common, I've been, I just think it's cool to see what you've been able to accomplish, the reach that you've been able to do, the, any attention you've gotten. Anytime I've seen you in the media, I've, I've been like, man, he's doing the, he's doing the right thing and getting the right stuff out there. So it really, you were on my list. I didn't say this before we hit record, but I had you on my list of people I was gonna eventually reach out to through Clifton. So when, when your folks reached out to me, it was a no brainer. I'm really glad that you're making the time for this conversation, man. Thank you, and I mean that so much. Uh, well, it's been really great talking to you. And um, yeah, I look forward to talking to you more on air, off air, hanging out sometime. Let's do all the things, man.